In this series about resistance, we have spoken about the most important and most frequent manifestations of resistance in the case of the patient. And indeed, that's the most important thing that psychotherapy and psychoanalysis deal with. It was almost blasphemous for many decades to even think that psychoanalysts can be in resistance as well. There was almost a religious belief that after the training analysis, we're like completely pure, completely clean, and something like resistance cannot happen to us. On the other hand, everything that was said about the silence in the patient is the opposite when it comes to the analyst. From the patient, we expect to free associate all the time, to talk basically all the time, and when the patient is silent for a longer period, we consider that a possible trace of resistance. With the analyst, the situation is the opposite, in that the analyst should be silent almost all the time, and then speak infrequently, briefly, and exactly to the point. Several years after the end of the World War II, Theodore Reich, an analyst who was in close personal contact with, with Freud, wrote a paper about silence in psychoanalysis and claimed that analysis begins when the patient realizes that not only is the analyst silent, but the analyst is going to remain silent. And this silence is something that people were trained to do and the expectation was that the silence of the analyst is completely cognitive, that there is no emotional undertone to it, but the analyst is reflecting, or later on we would say the analyst was fantasizing and trying to uh, observe his or her own uh, conscious reactions to what is going on but the words came only infrequently. Ferenczi was the first to write about the possible resistance in psychoanalysts, but this was in the Clinical Diary, written in 1932 and published only in 1985, where the opening sentences are about this, that patients might see us as re-traumatizing because they come to psychoanalysis to find, finally, someone who would reflect, someone who would be compassionate, empathetic, because the parents of their childhood were not. And now, if we are silent and blank screens, as, as Freud recommended, then they will just have the repetition of this painful experience with us. Additionally, with his work with Elizabeth Severn, Ferenczi allowed Severn to analyze him in this very controversial attempt at mutual analysis, and he believed he had discovered that indeed he was not capable of helping her because he was in resistance. The therapeutic treatment did not move forward because, he believed, Severn reminded him of his mother he hated her for being so strict and cold with him, and he took his revenge in not being really helpful. So this is historically very probably the first description of what we could call counter-transference resistance. This returns in the world of relational intersubjective psychoanalysis as a very important topic, and of course with the famous Winnicott's paper, Hate, in their counter-transference. So it's very difficult to say, thinking about one specific instance. There's a lot of things we would have to take into consideration. But theoretically speaking, it is possible that the analyst is silent sometimes, or silent for so long sometimes, because that is a manifestation of resistance. So we can probably think that the analyst being silent one session after the other is something we've been trained to do and many people follow this pattern. But there might be specific moments when silence is a manifestation of resistance in the analyst. For instance, the analyst wants to show who's the boss here, who's more powerful. 
and the silence can be a very powerful weapon for that. The analyst may feel offended, hurt, humiliated for a certain reason, not paid, challenged by the patient and so on, and probably a more powerful way to show the dominance is not to say anything but to remain silent, to remain in the, the regions, so to say, of silence. Then analysts can, or, or every analyst is, at least from time to time, on the thin ice. They are parts, domains where we all are limited, or we have some frustrations or insecurities and so on, and the reaction of the patient, a question, um, curiosity, seduction, threat, and so on, may lead us to the moments of very intense emotional reactions, with which we are not sure what to do with that moment, so we remain in the very safe space of silence, especially in the armchair behind the couch. Then, hypothetically, analysts could be repeating the experience of their own analysis. Just as the classical analysts used to be silent all the time, the analyst now imitates his or her analyst and approaches the patient not in an authentic way, but as uh, they saw it a uh, long time ago, or the patient could have been traumatized by his or her analyst silence 10, 20, 40 years ago, and now at a certain moment repeats this traumatic experience because possibly the patient is in the same position the analyst used to be in. These are a couple of hypothetical options, but what I believe is very important is that as psychotherapists, as psychoanalysts, we remain open to constantly challenging ourselves and scrutinizing ourselves because counter-transference resistance is a possibility and sometimes it would be very good for us talk to someone, look for advice, a brief supervision, an intervision group or something, so that we would be able to overcome this. The role of a silent analyst is to a certain extent necessary, but to a certain extent too comfortable that we would allow ourselves not to challenge.